I'm going to begin talking about the Frick Collection. I'm going to make some assumptions, which is that most of you know what it is. But um, just for the record, it is one of the finest collections of European art uh, in the world from the Renaissance through the 19th century and occupies you know, one of the most distinguished mansions from New York City of the beginning of the 20th century. And it's the harmony between the marriage between the collection and the house that really is what makes the Frick Collection. Um, it occupies an enviable position um, in the city, um, facing Central Park with uh, a wonderful uh, Olmsted Studio garden that relates to Central Park. Um, and of course, we have um, a garden that was designed by Russell Page in, uh, and opened in 1977. Um, many of you, I'm sure, also know that um, among the plans the Frick has put forward in the past, one most recently was to build on the site where the 70th Street Garden is. There was an outpouring of concern. We listened. Uh, we withdrew that plan. Um, and it's really because of that that we went back to the drawing board, had another search. Um, and fortunately for us, ended up with Annabelle Seldorf as the design architect. Um, and um, Bayer Blender Bell, a Richard Southwick partner, is the uh, executive architect uh, on this project. But working with Annabelle and her team in particular has been um, uh, a treat for us uh, as architects who truly listen um, and um, work with us in a, a very creative way. The Essence of the Frick really uh, is the display of art inside. And um, Henry Clay Frick, and later his daughter, who was a very important part of the history of the Frick, uh, because she continued collecting um, after her father died. Um, it is uh, a collection that is not like most museums. It's not that uh, we don't display um, our art in terms of periods or schools. Um, so in the living room, for example, you see a great portrait by El Greco flanked by two equally great portraits by Holbein, um, Near Eastern carpet, Chinese porcelain, Italian Renaissance bronzes, French 18th century Boulle furniture, a mix of things that is um, very redolent of the spirit of collecting in New York and really in, in the higher levels of around the world in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and though there is a stanchion around this carpet because we can't let people walk on it. One of the great things about the Frick is that by and large there are no plexiglass uh, or cases or things that, may, uh, that keep you away from the works of art. You're invited to go up and look close and be part of it. You're in invited to be part of a house. You are a guest in a house. So this is what we, our charge is, our responsibility is to keep this. We love the quality of these downstairs galleries, um, and they will not be changing. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what does have to change to make uh, this institution be able to continue effectively into the future. Um, but a centerpiece uh, of our plans is to open up the second floor. This will first allow our public to fully understand the, the, the house from the more private quarters upstairs to the more public rooms downstairs. Um, we are working particularly with Bayer Blender Bell down to the level of doorknobs doing a preservation inventory that will look at everything that we've got so that we know that what we can preserve um, as we convert um, the second floor into gallery space. Interestingly, um, there were plans drawn up in 1932, immediately after Adelaide Frick's death, um, to turn the second floor into public galleries. Uh, that never happened, but now is the time. Uh, as I'll explain, our collection has grown, uh, so we need more space to show the collection. It's very appropriate that, that we do that in the context of the house. Um, and the public, I think, will be very happy to be able to go upstairs and see this space. So, the Frick is a perfect place. Everybody tells me that. Why do we need to make any changes at all? Um, we are, first of all, a house that was retrofitted as a public institution. Um, there are always disjunctions in that, and we're trying to correct those. But as I look at the overall project goals, they really fall under four categories, which have to do with art, education, our visitors' needs, and our infrastructure. Um, we need more space um, to show our collection, which has grown. Um, we need a better temporary exhibition space. We often have to take down 
the permanent collection in order to make room for our temporary exhibitions, which are um, highly acclaimed, so we want to try to correct that. We need better conservation space uh, in order to both uh, work on the objects in our collection, and the conservators are also the ones that take care of the house, the maintenance of the house itself. Um, our education program is really only 20 years old, um, but it has grown enormously uh, in that period, and yet we have no classrooms, we have no place for students to hang their coats or put backpacks um, into lockers. Um, we need to connect to our library. We have one of the greatest art reference libraries, but there's no direct connection between the collection and the library. Um, we need a better auditorium because we're constantly turning people away and the room uh, is acoustically challenged. Um, so that is also part of our plan. Uh, in terms of our visitors' needs, they're often um, crammed into a small reception hall, especially on weekends. Our coat rooms are too small, so it means that people have to stand outside. Our bathrooms are too small. Um, the people are often spilling into the old house before they've finished what they need to know in order to enjoy their visit. Um, so we need a larger lobby. Um, and we're talking about a cafe. We're one of the only museums in the world where you can't get a coffee. Uh, and I'm convinced that if people can, can have a cup of coffee, they can stay a little longer and discuss what they've seen, uh, and that will only add to their enjoyment um, of the experience. And finally, infrastructure. We're um, a building that was, we're two buildings really, one finished in 1914 and one in 1935, and Annabelle will go more deeply into that history. Um, but with all that, there are leaking skylights, electrical systems, and so on that need to be uh, repaired. So let me go just a little bit deeper into some of these programmatic needs for you. Um, our collection has more than doubled since we opened to the public in 1935. Um, it, we have not acquired a huge number of paintings. Uh, in that time, I'm showing you um, a uh, painting by Murillo, a self-portrait by this Spanish mid-17th century painter um, that is one of only two self-portraits in the world. The other is in the National Gallery in London. We recently did an exhibition with them about Murillo portraits. Um, where we have really grown in our collections are decorative arts over the last 20 years, and particularly in the last 10 years, um, we've recently acquired the Meissen porcelain collection of Henry Arnhold, who just died last year, uh, last summer, um, one of the finest collections in the world of this, collect, of this type of um, decorative arts. Um, we have been given 14 of the finest works of Dupacier porcelain, that's the factory that succeeded, was the next factory after Meissen to um, discover the Chinese secret of how to make true porcelain. Uh, from the Sullivan Collection, which is the finest collection in the world. We currently have on view um, a collection of French faience from Sid Knafel, which is promised to us, and it also is the finest collection in the world of its type. Um, and we're being given, um, over time, the Schur Portrait Medals Collection. These are medals from the Renaissance through the 19th century, and it is far and away the finest collection in the world of portrait medals. So we continue to acquire at the very highest level um, we acquire selectively. We're not taking everything. We're choosing very carefully what we add to the collection, uh, but it has grown. And most of these are small-scale objects, which will be well served by opening up the second floor, the more intimate spaces on, the second, on, on that level. Um, our exhibitions have also um, become increasingly important over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, the Van Dyck Portrait Show, for example, was the first exhibition ever to look at all media in Van Dyck's um, portraits. Um, the Pierre Gutier show that we did, which was on this um, a, a decorative artist of the 18th century in France who specialized in uh, ormolu. He was the finest ever to chase and make gilt bronze work. Um, Apollo magazine cited this as the finest decorative arts exhibition of the year. Uh, the Turner exhibition was really the first exhibition to look at the theme of ports in his work. So we have been doing increasingly important exhibitions, which is a service to our public um, because all of the exhibitions have as their philosophy that we are making exhibitions that relate to the permanent collection so that when our public returns, um, they have a deeper knowledge um, of um, the works of art they see. As I walk through the Frick Collection now, after my eight years there, um, I'm 
constantly reminded of how I've learned more about the Turners or about the Gutierre uh, and can put it into a wider context. And I think this is a very important aspect of, of what we do at the Frick. So along with that, we need a better exhibition hall. We need conservation uh, in order to take care of the, the incoming loans. We need routes through the building to get art um, to um, storage, to conservation, to the temporary exhibition spaces, and Annabelle will talk about that. Conservation is a, a very important part, of course, of what we do. Um, the library is one of the most important of its kind in the world. Um, some 25% of its holdings are unique and cannot be found in any other um, World Cat library, so the conservation of these works is, is critical. Um, the conservators have done what they can, putting their machinery and their tables in corridors, emptying out stacks, uh, but now is the opportunity to actually give them um, a proper, um, up-to-date uh, set of facilities to do their work. Um, the objects conservators occupy 350 square feet of a, a former servant's room on the third floor. Um, they do their best with this small space. There's no running water. Um, some of the top objects conservators in the world make use of this space. Um, so we really want to give them um, the equipment, the state-of-the-art um, um, space and resources that they need. Um, and finally, um, large objects can't get up to our conservation room in the first place. So you're looking at one of our conservators um, in a pop-up uh, room in which we had to build a small little space for our Udon Diana in our lobby. It was the only way that we could do the conservation work on it. So an important part of this too is having freight elevators, art elevators that can take the works um, to the conservation area. Um, as I said, uh, our education programs have really uh, flourished in recent years. Um, we run a, a host of programs from middle school through graduate school and for the general public, um, handling uh, two to 3,000 students a year, for example, and many, many programs beyond that. Um, I'm also particularly proud of the partnerships that we've developed with other institutions, whether it's um, uh, Columbia Hospital, where we've had a narrative medicine program going back 15 years, which teaches doctors how to look, how to be perceptive, using art as a means to do that, uh, or a program that we have that's now five years old with the Ghetto Film School, uh, which is the only film teaching pro program in a, in a public high school, in a South Bronx high school, in which the, the students come in, they learn about our, our art collection. Um, many of them have never been in a museum before, and they make a film at the end of that about or inspired by a work of art at the Frick. So it's been this very interesting um, kind of collaboration with, a, with an institution. So we love these kinds of programs, um, but we need the facilities in order to be able to continue to do them well. Um, I mentioned our library. It is one of the top five art reference libraries in the world. Um, it's the only one that's open and free to the public. Um, many of you sitting in this room probably don't know that we have uh, an art reference library that's open to anyone who's here. Um, and that's partly because there's no direct passageway from the collection to the library, which is entered from 71st Street. Um, so this is one of our goals, to um, connect these two institutions, to make them more accessible uh, to the public, but also to integrate the two institutions. The, the library was uh, founded by uh, Helen Clay Frick um, and in 1920, uh, and it was a separate institution until her death in 1984. So we want to join these institutions uh, and prepare the library also for uh, the digital age. Um, digital art history is becoming increasingly important. Um, the library is a leader in a consortium of photo archives that um, puts, will put together ultimately about 25 million images of works of art and what librarians call the metadata, the uh, writing that's associated with these works of art. Um, and we're working to, have, uh, to make all of this accessible on the internet eventually to everybody. We also work on more local level. This is uh, what's called ARIES, a program that we developed with NYU School of Engineering, which is essentially uh, an electronic light box. Um, if there's some of you in the audience who, like me, started teaching by putting 35 millimeter slides on what we call light boxes, and they were 
projected in what were called uh, carousel projectors back in the old days. Um, this is an electronic light box which allows one to, um, say, feed in a group of Van Dyck portraits, um, and you can overlay one of our portraits on another and it will automatically size them and you can instantly see that actually he used the same drawing and cartoon for this, this, these two images. Uh, you can also size them and put them on the walls of a room so you can use them to design an exhibition. We, we did this by actually talking to art historians and asking them what they wanted. So this is the kind of, of work that the, that the Frick Art Reference Library does. Um, and they want to have a digital art history laboratory which will allow more collaborative uses of their resources. Um, I said earlier that we need to address the needs of our visitors more. Um, our reception hall is often crowded. Um, we need to have the facilities to make their visit um, uh, more pleasant. We also need uh, very much to address ADA access. Again, as an old house, uh, it's very difficult to get um, wheelchairs in. Uh, they cannot get in the front door as it stands now. They have to go through uh, a ramp that goes uh, down into the basement level. Um, and at that point, um, we have to ask them often to get out of their wheelchairs and use one of ours because they won't fit into the 1914 Otis elevator with accordion doors. Um, so this is something we, we absolutely want to do is to make our collections accessible to everybody throughout. Infrastructure, um, many of you know about working with old buildings. Um, our skylights are either 100 or 80 years old. Um, they leak, the glass has been replaced at odd times, different panes of glass over the years. Um, it's time to, to replace them completely um, and to build uh, a, an impermeable sh uh, shield so that we'll keep our climate control um, well inside to introduce new lighting systems that will use the latest technologies of lighting um, to, uh, and lighting is of course absolutely critical for an art museum. Um, our heating and air conditioning systems are on their last legs. Um, our electrical system uh, dates to 1935 and has been valiantly kept up, but all of these need to be completely overhauled. And so of course all of this means that we're gonna have to close. Um, this is something I had to face up to um, a couple of years ago, and as I was looking for ways to solve uh, this problem, to uh, continue to keep uh, our collection open to the public during construction, which is our mission, um, I was very fortunate that I was able to find a kind of partnership between the Whitney, the Metropolitan Museum, which had been leasing the Whitney uh, building on 75th and Madison, um, and ourselves. Uh, and so we will be closing about a year from now, and we will move into the Whitney. Um, it will look very different. Um, Annabelle Seldorf is actually helping us to shape the spaces. We're not gonna try to recreate um, the Frick in uh, a 1966 Brutalist building. It would, would not work, but what will work is, uh, is, a, is a new look at our collection, which I, I'm uh, finding very fascinating to kind of look at how we will redeploy the collection, learn from it. Um, I think it'll, it will be fascinating to our public. Um, and about four years from now, we will return um, and we will go back to the beautiful West Gallery. It will look as exactly as it has, um, only we'll have new and improved skylights, better lighting systems, um, better uh, temperature control and humidity, better education spaces to allow you to understand what you are going to see or have seen, um, conservation to, to um, protect and, uh, and preserve all of the works we have. Um, everyone will be able to come in the front door and enjoy our spaces um, regardless of their conditions. And um, overall, uh, we are, are preparing the institution to continue to do uh, even better what it does now uh, and, and prepare it for its future. So Annabelle will now talk a little bit about how we're actually going to do that. When Ian just with his last slide introduced all of the things that you can expect, I thought you shouldn't give it away because I really hope that people will come by the time that we're done and not know exactly what was changed, only that it just feels perfect. And it feels pretty perfect now. The Frick has always been um, 
one of my favorite museums, maybe my favorite museum for the many years that I've lived in New York. Um, and when we were asked to participate in this project, uh, there was a lot of learning that had to go into it. We studied very carefully <clears throat> the morphology of the project, and we studied very carefully the history of the building. And what you see here are really the different periods already. Ian has talked a little bit about it. All that which is in the light color is the Thomas Hastings of Career and Hastings building uh, that Henry Clay Frick worked on with Thomas Hastings and it was finished in 1914. Uh, Mr. Frick lived there with his family until he died and thereafter his wife remained in the building um, and, and uh, after her death the museum was slated to become <laughs> the house was slated to become a museum. So in 1935, the museum opened um, under the direction of the architect John Russell Pope. And all that which you see here in the brighter yellow is the part that Pope uh, added and, and uh, yeah, essentially just added um, to the existing house. Then in 1941, uh, the Frick proceeded to purchase a variety, or rather three, townhouses that were located right here. And somehow there should probably be a drawing that would show that these very sizable townhouses occupied this space at one time. So in 1941, the easternmost townhouse was purchased and uh, promptly demolished in order to create a vault and a kind of uh, fortification against possible ills by the Germans. That would be me. Um, <laughs> just a little later. Um, anyway, this part of the building is excavated or this part of the garden, rather, I should say, uh, is excavated in three stories, and I'll show you images of that later on. Then in 1977, um, Bailey, Van Dyck, and Polar created a new reception hall, and they left these other, this other parcel untouched, except for creating a wall that surrounded a garden uh, that was designed by Russell Page, as Ian already mentioned. Then nothing happened for a very long time, and uh, in 2011, desperately looking for space to exhibit uh, some of the beautiful decorative arts, the Portico Gallery was enclosed by Davis Brody Bond. And so just to lead you on a little bit of a tour, uh, this is the original building as it was built and designed by, uh, by Hastings, always following um, the entire block between 70th and 71st Street. In my mind, it's very important to understand that what Mr. Frick did was very courageous already. There was the famous Lennox Library there, and he simply tore it down to make way for his significant mansion. And here you can see it under construction. He has very ambitious plans to house his collection. And all during the time that he built this house, this mansion, um, he pr continued to purchase art and decorative art items uh, that would serve for furniture and decoration in the building. Yeah, these are some of the images. Uh, for example, this is the portico that, of course, remains unchanged except for the fact that it is enclosed now. But what one doesn't appreciate anymore is that there was a port cocher that allowed uh, coaches to go all the way through the block um, from 70th Street to 71st Street. Then, of course, uh, in 1933, John Russell Pope came along uh, and modified the building, modified the existing building only very little, uh, but enough to add um, a garden court where there was the port cochere that went through, modify the entrance, which happened 
which previously was sideways, uh, and created a sort of entrance sequence that is more or less what you see today. And here, of course, what you also see is the construction of a nine-story library. Um, he elongated the long blank wall along 71st Street and very courageously actually doubled it in size until it meets the library volume. I've always thought that that was one of the most beautiful gestures and I think, I dare say that that is one of the most beautiful walls maybe in the world. And here you see a couple of images of um, the new library that sort of uh, sits on 71st Street like a punctuation mark and right next to it an image of a much smaller library that Thomas Hastings built in 1925 um, that housed many fewer uh, books and that already in 1935 was insufficient. So Russell Pope simply um, tore it down and made way for his own new library. So then in the 70s, this little reception building was added by Van Dyke Polar. And you can see it here. It's a single, a tall single story building. It's actually really a story and a half. And this is an image from the inside of it. Uh, because if you look at the plan carefully, it was divided lengthwise in two to accommodate a staircase, a sort of uncomfortable staircase that goes down to what used to be education spaces, later became exhibition spaces, and a sort of very um, long bookstore that you may remember. And here, of course, is an image of the beautiful 70th Street Garden as conceived by Russell Page. Um, and when I look at this image, I always think uh, that, like everybody else, I thought that garden had always been there. But, of course, that wasn't at all the case, because here you see <laughs> the, that which was excavated, and you understand all of a sudden that the uh, 70th Street Garden effectively is a roof garden. So finally, here is um, the plan of the uh, enclosure of the, of the uh, loggia. And now back to an axonometric image that uh, adds all the volume that we are looking to add to the building. And so what's interesting to understand about where we're adding is that the rear of the library had never really been finished. There is a rear yard behind the library um, that was essentially empty. And that was uh, the reason why the rear elevation of the library is not particularly elegant. It was never meant to be seen. Um, and so it gives us an opportunity to uh, build just a few square feet back here and also add a two-story portion over the existing um, belly of the building, so to speak. So when you look at it in plan, parallel to the old house, parallel to the addition of, of uh, Russell Pope, uh, comes a smaller addition uh, over the heart of the building or the, the center of the building, and uh, a little bit of space over the existing reception building. Here is the addition to the rear of the library, and this L-shape or T-shape, perhaps, uh, allows us to make connections that uh, fulfill all of these requirements that Ian so eloquently already described. To that end, what this drawing shows um, we took our clues from the size of the existing library. It was very important to us that the library would just simply uh, stay in its, in its form and be extended a little bit. 
Then there is a sort of connector piece right here that is a little bit more open, a little bit more transparent, and gives us an opportunity to actually connect all that which is collection with the library and the educational purpose. Then, like a sibling to the volume, the lower volume of the, of the rear of the library, sits a, uh, an addition which allows uh, conservation to take place and allows to, uh, to, to house administration and other back of house issues. So I wanted to take you all around just to show that in fact the addition is very discreet, sits back from the uh, existing buildings and in fact will hardly be visible, certainly not on 71st Street. Um, and on 70th Street, really only because you're looking at it through the garden. I do believe that along Fifth Avenue, the addition is hardly noticeable at all because it becomes part of the overall composition of the multiple volumes that present themselves to the park. And just to explain a little bit more about the floor plan, I think it is most important to understand that by the time that we're finished with the renovation, none of the spaces that everybody has learned to love are in any way different. Uh, you will arrive at the Frick and you may or may not have a certain path that you like to take to your favorite painting or to your favorite work of art, and that will be completely unencumbered. Like I said before, I dare you to recognize all the beautiful things that make your experience better. But I don't think they will, re you know, they're not going to be different. What is different is that we have opened up the volume of the reception hall, that we're connecting uh, new spaces, a new special exhibition space and education space. Uh, all the way here from 70th Street. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, just suffice it to say that the reception hall, by opening this central arch here, is much more connected, the entrance hall I meant, uh, is much more connected to the reception hall. We're turning a ticket office around. There are new elevators that bring access to the second floor and down to the lower levels, a new staircase that also connects you, and then straight ahead uh, you get to the special exhibitions and here uh, to the study center. So in a way what happens is uh, that we are utilizing the garden uh, to, to bring the connect, the to connect the library and the collection in such a way that they feel completely inevitable and, and expected. Everything really is about accommodating people. When in bad weather people are lining on the street now, in big part that is because it takes a little while to get rid of your coat. Instead, what is happening now is people will arrive, uh, their bags will be checked. I would really like to get rid of the bag checks, but that's not up to me. Um, you enter, you buy your ticket, you proceed either via the elevator or via this very nice stair, a small level down the stairs where there is a very comfortable uh, coat check and, and uh, great facilities for people to get ready for their, uh, for their visit to the museum. So here are a couple of, of early renderings of these spaces. Again, when you enter the building today, you can enter, look straight into the garden court. Um, there's that center arch which we have opened, which I'm very excited about because it'll bring a little bit of daylight into the entrance hall, which is, tends to be a little dark right now. And then you proceed along um, into the reception hall. So uh, in this particular case, uh, you can't see the elevator, which is to your right, which is of course vital to the entire experience. As we're opening the second floor, uh, I just quickly want to finish here on the ground floor that you're passing by, you can pass by 
to get into the study center, to have an entire uh, ground floor of the library now dedicated to education. And what's really fantastic about that is that there are now competing visitors flows. There are the students who come in groups, who need to be introduced, who need to leave their backpacks, etc. Ian already mentioned that. They can now enter uh, on 71st Street, sort of be uh, instructed as a group, leave their things here and um, proceed either into the collection or uh, take a class in the study center. In turn, we very much hope that most people will go around the museum in the way in which they always do and then find their way into the special exhibitions. There may be some people who want to go directly to special exhibitions and then from there proceed into the, into the gallery. So there's a lot of flexibility in a space that is not enormous, but that is commensurate with the kinds of exhibitions that, um, that the museum has had for, for the last few years. And while Ian mentioned earlier that the exhibitions always relate to the permanent collection in one way or another, I think it is also uh, important to know that these exhibitions that he quoted simply every time required that the permanent collection be displaced. And it's very important to understand that um, the works of art are, are safer when they don't have to move around so frequently. So just to illustrate a little bit what I mentioned earlier, the, when you're coming from 70th Street, you can proceed straight through the education hall um, and you can actually see all the way through to the garden on 70th Street. And symbolically, this is something that's very important to us. Um, overall, these incredibly beautiful and elegant uh, Beaux-Arts buildings are also a little bit forbidding. They're not very open, they're not very transparent. And so getting glimpses through the building I think is something that visitors will enjoy and appreciate a great deal and that sort of um, offers a little bit of, of a sort of bright moment, so to speak. And here is an early rendition of what the study center may look like. Uh, you have views into the garden, um, which of course is, is a very nice experience. The garden was always meant to be a tableau garden, to be looked at rather than to be experienced from within. Um, but in this uh, small edition, we're looking to actually allow more people to uh, view and enjoy the garden. And here is an image of the, of the special exhibition space. We tested the room uh, by utilizing an exhibition that had taken place in the East Gallery adjacent to it. And what's interesting about it is that some of these openings already exist. So in a funny way, it actually is very, um, it's very simple for that to happen. So here now you're having the view that I described earlier, you're looking at the staircase that leads up or down. Uh, you're looking straight ahead towards special exhibitions or to the right into the, um, into the garden. And then right here are the elevators which can take you up or down. And of course, everybody has always been at the bottom of that stair and wondered what it would be like to be able to go up I must say, I still appreciate it every time I'm, I'm able to do that. Um, it is such a wonderful stair, and I'm incredibly excited that this is going to be part of the visitor's experience. But, of course, it's also very important to connect everybody, and so, um, as I mentioned before, there are elevators going from the expanded lobby, and they can take people up, and across into the galleries. And that, of course, is a very nice thing, being that the old elevators are simply too small and can't be retrofitted to, uh, to do better duty for those who can't take the stairs. Um, but what this lobby does as well, and in, at the same time, I should also mention that the ceiling 
in the ground floor lobby is going to be a little bit lower. It's going to be not 18 feet anymore, but I think 17 feet or something. And then in the, we're adding some six feet, six, seven feet to the, to the building in a recessed kind of conservatory style um, building so that on the second floor you can effectively connect. And you can connect into the old building, as I already mentioned, but you can also connect uh, in an eastern direction to the small cafe that's overlooking the garden uh, right here. Now, downward, under the restored garden, um, you will be finding a new auditorium that will house about 220 people and is um, something that I think is going to really serve its purpose very well, not only because it'll be a beautiful auditorium, but also because it can be operated completely independently of operating hours from the museum. And that, of course, is a very important and, um, and big concern for the museum, being that many of these events take place oftentimes after museum hours. So, I'm sorry to put you through the paces by making you look at all the floor plans. Um, to me, that's like reading the newspaper, but um, I hope that you can follow me easily enough by looking at the colors. So here, what you see again over the old house, all that which is that lovely ochre color, um, is connecting to now public space um, uh, on the second floor. Um, all that which is blue is administration and uh, meeting rooms, all the way tucked into using every square inch, I promise, um, are the spaces that were previously either a little bit too um, not climatized and, and not really uh, functional. So we're utilizing every square inch that is, that is available. In, in the library building is also some expanded uh, uh, administration space, but very important to understand is that we're inserting a freight elevator right in the middle of the building so that the path of art is much improved in such a way um, that the art path doesn't interfere with the visitor or, or staff path. And I'm afraid I didn't explain that perfectly uh, because what I should have said in the, um, in the previous plan, I should have shown you that we are creating a, an accessible ramp that allows people to get in on the ground floor. I talked to you about these elevators that bring you up to the second floor or down, um, but I didn't show that also on the 71st Street there will be a ramp that gets, um, provides accessible access to the library. And that is a very complicated thing because we are dealing with a historic building. There are uh, head height issues. You can only enter below the East Gallery and to explain that in greater detail would probably really put everybody to sleep. Um, but take my word for it, it's like a Rubik's Cube. Um, having worked on this now for well over two years, I feel like we are at a point where we know the building and we know how to do justice to the fantastic fabric that is constituted by those different periods of architecture. Um, but we're also able to sort of bring in new systems, to bring in more energy-friendly climate systems, more um, better quality lighting, uh, LED lighting, therefore much more energy saving, um, and also paying attention to developments in the library which include digital classrooms and things of that nature. In the process, of course, everything is at play. In the process, um, book stacks have to move. We're moving some stacks into the basement where we're uh, creating a safe space under the garden court, etc., etc. 
if you have a little, a few more hours, I will continue. But um, what is very important, of course, is to follow the path of the, of the visitor. And so now that you have come up the staircase or taken the elevator or come uh, after you have visited the, the galleries on the second floor, you find yourself on the second floor of the reception building and there is a generous uh, uh, welcoming space where you can enjoy looking down on the garden and a small shop that is sort of looking uh, in a southern direction um, that will be very nice and is perhaps not prime um, commercial real estate, um, but nor is the Frick. And so we thought that it was a very nice thing to sort of bring the cafe together with the museum shop and open area where people can sort of sit and enjoy um, what, they, what they have just learned. Um, very few people maybe really just the gardeners and the ducks, are able to enjoy this view. But we like to show it because um, we think that our addition of this conservatory style uh, roof uh, addition to the existing reception hall is successful in as much as it really leaves the elevation of the, of the original 77 building uh, pretty well alone. Now you're finding yourself at the lower level, uh, having taken the elevator or the stair, and there is an in-between level where there are coat rooms and bathrooms. Um, but at the lower level, there is a, a very elegant ante-room that leads you into the auditorium that has a sort of semi-round um, uh, organization. There's bathrooms, preparatory spaces, uh, all the purple spaces are back of house. And uh, what you can see here is that we're really making very good use of, of the space as much as is possible. Um, we've been at times asked why we aren't digging below the Fifth Street, uh, Fifth Avenue garden. <clears throat> and it's quite simple. It is, uh, first of all, because we would have to cut down the magnolia trees. All right, we're not doing that. <clears throat> but um, I think more importantly, or just as important, it is, uh, is to understand that some of these spaces over here are very far away uh, from where the action is. And it's impossible to bring daylight in there. It's impossible to provide safe egress. And so we're doing everything we can to use the space that is available for mechanical space. This area over here is unexcavated, and believe me, I had every plan in the book to put all sorts of things in there. Um, but you do have to be careful with not endangering the building and not moving more things than is absolutely necessary in order not to cause cracks and, um, and damage to the old building. And so here is a quick image of what this ensemble looks like. It gives me an opportunity to show you, again, the ramp that goes uh, in an eastern direction and then turns into a western direction. I imagine that it's going to actually be very nice to go this way because you catch a glimpse of the garden without the fence. Um, but then you return and you land uh, right at the front door where where everybody enters the building. You see, um, from a slightly elevated point of view, what this conservatory style um, roof addition looks like, and the two siblings over here flanking uh, the rear of the garden and, and, uh, and being linked through this, what we call the bridge. I wanted to show you just for, uh, one moment what our inspirations for the, for the edition has been. Um, when you're dealing with buildings as beautiful as the Hastings building and the Pope building, um, of course, you feel quite intimidated. So uh, we, we collected a great many details and, and um, 
impressions of the building. And one of the things that I like best about the Pope Library is the sort of um, taught u utilization of Indiana limestone. And while these pictures are not the best photographs, uh, they do illustrate a little bit the punctured windows. And that is, in fact, what we are looking uh, to emulate in some way um, with, with very simple uh, regular windows, and then uh, where there is more transparency as the link in between the two building volumes, um, I believe that it's going to be a very elegant and very simply uh, detailed bronze um, transition, a loggia uh, of some kind. And just to quickly show you some images where the new building takes place, and here, that long, beautiful wall. And I think that is it. Thank you very much. So could you speak a little bit more about the appropriateness of context versus being unique? Well, I think that is a fantastic question uh, in as much as it's very difficult to answer. Um, I think it is always important to be sympathetic to the context, especially when there is one that is as beautiful and, um, and important. Um, I believe that our building will be very much a background building, and that is the main reason why we've chosen to use materials that are virtually identical. Having said that, uh, the detailing is not apologetic. It's not trying to um, be the same. It's not a building from 1935. Um, it'll be a contemporary building, and it will be that in its kind of restrained presence. It will not feel sad, it will not feel poor, um, but it will stand on its own two feet and it will be distinct enough so as not to look like somebody just put more pastry on, on the uh, cake. Your question really requires a long discussion, <laughs> and I think um, I've more or less said what I think uh, you should understand. The question is that of collaboration with other outstanding architects. When you received the design commission at the Clark, you had to work with the Tadeo Ando. Here you're working with Bayer Blinder Bell. Could you discuss a little bit what are the to's and fro's for you, both as the design architect and in creating a team, as to what is handed off to whom how this works, and what it means in terms of collaboration. The other quick question is, will, is there a chance that the budget allows for the restoration of the organ? I will let Ian talk about the organ. Um, where the collaborations are concerned, I think that architecture in its nature is a collaborative art. And um, while many of us grew up with the brooding architect uh, and yes, I have spent many a night all by myself at my desk. Um, I think there is nothing better than working with intelligent people. And I think it's not just architects working with colleagues. Uh, it's the opportunity to work with a fantastic team. Here at the Frick, uh, we were given the opportunity to um, to talk to different architects and, and define together with Ian and his team who the best collaborators were. And we're incredibly, um, it sounds maybe not quite right, we're very, very happy to be working with Bayer Blinder Bell who are tremendously knowledgeable and uh, have a really deep bench where preservation is concerned. And, uh, the, concert, the conversations between us are, are always interesting. They're always um, full of new information and full of exchange. At the Clark, um, it was a different kind of, of working together that 
can't truly be called working together because we were in charge of the existing building of the museum building um, and there was really only very little conversation about where those two buildings meet. Um, ultimately, the people who foster the dialogue are really our clients and that is true of course at the Frick. I mean there is nothing I cherish more than uh, the, the conversations we have with Ian and the curators and, um, and the really incredible team who is supporting our efforts. Um, some of them are here. Hello everybody. Um, and they help bring us all together. So again, in a slightly wordy version, it's all about collaboration. Um, I guess the organ question's for me. <laughs> a year or two after I arrived at the Frick, um, so around um, 2012, 2013, I uh, became interested in the organ and uh, it hadn't, hasn't been played for about 15 years now. Um, it's an Aeolian organ, it was installed in 1914, very beautiful organ. Um, there was a person who I talked to at that point who thought about contributing to it. It would cost about one and a half to two million dollars to replace it and to refurbish it to get it working again. Um, her question was a very simple one. If, if, if she gave the money for that, could we have uh, organ concerts and would we be able to have some of the, the finest um, musicians to play on it? And as I started doing research in it, there have been many uh, organists who have studied it over the years. Um, it turns out it never had a great sound. 1914 turns out not to have been a great year for organs, Aeolian <laughs> organs. Um, and you know, the best place to hear it was actually in uh, a bathroom on the second floor. But in, in Frick's day, it was obviously meant for him to hear in the dining room. And so there's a couple of problems. One is it, it, it will never be a great sounding organ, um, and so it doesn't you know, call for a music program to use it. Uh, and the second is there's no real place for an audience to sit and hear the music in the first place because it was really meant for, for him to hear it in the, in the dining room. So we're, we're not at present um, contemplating um, refurbishing it as part of the plan, uh, but we will keep it all the, you know, you will be able to see this beautiful organ. We may have uh, recordings made. Uh, that's, I think, the best we can do at the moment. Thank you. Annabelle, I'm curious about the bridge and why it is so different than the two buildings that it's joining. It bothers me, that's why I'm asking. I'm sorry that it bothers you. <laughs> because I aim to please. Well, there, it's, it's actually a really interesting conversation because we've done many, many studies about it. There have been different versions of it. Um, to begin with, if you think about it, the edition is really one edition. Um, so it could be just one massive uh, limestone building, and that did not look very nice. At the end of the day, so I... Um, invite you to go around the Upper East Side, and I think that you'll find quite a few um, places that have similar detailing. I think that sort of simple vertical detailing um, negotiates something that is outright uh, glass and, and see-through. I believe that you'll be pleasantly surprised when you see the detail that is tactile, that has a sort of, that where the material speaks, um, and it's what makes horse races. <laughs> it looks like design by committee. It does not look like it's a, a solid two pieces and then this modern little rebase structure. I don't mind it at all about the, the new construction, well, you know, the conservatory, that's lovely up there. It looks like a penthouse. But the, the one that, if you bridge joining the two, why can't you use different materials? Is this carved in stone now? This is how it's going to be? This is how it's going to be. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I will tell you that there will be happy moments for you when you see that the institution is alive, that people will be 
uh, going there. And I can't promise you that the quality of the detail is going to be really beautiful. So I hope that I'll manage to change your mind.